Welcome to the first session of Destinations for Tough Shanae and Tess. It's great to be here, and I'm welcoming all of you from all the yeshivas that you're coming. We're all here for one reason, out of Avas Hashem, our love for Hashem, which leads to a desire to want to take that beautiful Torah that we have and spread it to Jews all around the world, be it a firm Jew, be it someone who's unaffiliated. But in order to do that, we're here today, and the next seven sessions in, in total eight, to be able to gain the skills to be Marbet's Torah, to spread Torah, care of training, as well as the Ashkafa, the Amuna classes, and how to give over the truth of the Torah and the beauty of the Torah to others. There'll be announcements in the middle of the sessions. We're going to have a two minute break in between the two sessions. Keep in mind, in general, we'll be starting at 8 o'clock to give you guys more time to get in for, from after Shabbos. <clears throat> and we'll end around 10 15, ideally, try to get things moving so it doesn't end too late. <clears throat> The first session is being taught by Moshe Zeldman, who I can go on about, and if it was up to me, I would have Rav Zeldman teach every class in this seminar. Rav Zeldman's topic is an introduction to Kirov. And Rav Zeldman travels the world, as well as very famous in Asia Torah itself, as being the Imuna Rebbe, all your questions in faith, in, ha- in Hashkafa, in a Kirov expert who has many, many, many hours and years of dealing with with Bali Tshuva and all types of Jews from all across the world. It's a big honor and privilege to have our expert, Ramosha Zelman, tonight. Shavuot Tov. Pleasure to be here. Um, okay, so as an introductory class, um, there's lots to talk about in terms of framing a little bit what Kirub is all about. Um, you can imagine yourself sitting on an airplane heading back from Eric Yisrael beside some guy who's not from and figuring out, like, so what do I say? What do I not say? Do I say anything? Do I just dive in? <laughs> how, do I, how do I get through to this guy? What if he asks me questions? There's a lot to talk about. So for this introductory session, I want to give like an overall framework of sort of like the dynamics of what really goes on in, the, in a Kiruv encounter. Um, I just came back now uh, a couple of days ago. I was traveling the States. I've spoken about four campuses, five campuses around the States. Um, so I like, it's imagine like this. I, I spent my time on campus in UCLA and Rutgers and Washington and, and uh, Colorado on campuses dealing with guys who are completely, completely not from... Um, Many of them, most of them actually have never met an Orthodox rabbi in their life. They know really almost nothing. No day school background, mamish nothing. They don't believe in God. A lot of them call themselves atheists. Um, and the hope is that a good class or a good presentation will convince a bunch of them to come to Eretz Yisrael and to come to Eshat Torah and to take the beginner's classes, um, where I teach also across the hall here, a program called Essentials. We hope that some of those will move on to the more advanced program called the Foundations Program where they're learning a little bit more B.U. and starting to learn Hebrew and Gemara. I teach on that level as well. A few years later, then a base medrash, and a few years later, then a speaker program, right? The ideal would be a guy at the end of six, seven years has gone from a beginner to a point where he is a trained rabbi with enough learning under his belt that he's a ben Torah, he has Yerushalayim, and he knows how to play in Judaism to people who don't know. And I teach on all these different various programs. So I get to see the guy from stage one when he first walks in the door knowing nothing, to the point where he's now, you know, he's been learning for many years and he's ready to start reaching out. He's gone through all the process of becoming from. So, of course, any Jew who starts getting involved with Yiddishkeit is going to go through many stages in many different ways. I'm also a Baal Tshuva myself. I went through my own stages in my own ways. took a long time. Um, and even though there's different personalities and different, different uh, styles and, you know, people sort of go through the process in different ways, I think it's fair to say that most people become from in two basic stages, okay? And I want to try and describe the stages to you because they're the kind of stages that you're going to want to encounter yourself when you're dealing with somebody who's not from. The first one is a stage that I call Torah's Chaim, right? You're presenting Torah to somebody who doesn't know Torah. You're presenting Torah in a framework that we're going to call Torah's Chaim, Torah's Chaim. And the second is a stage that we're going to call Torah's Emes. Torah's Chaim, Torah's Emes. <coughs> 
What is the fr- and Chazal use these words? Chazal described Torah as Torah Chaim. They describe Torah as Torah Semitz. We say it in the Tefillah. We say it in the, in the Gemara talks about it. The phrase Torah Chaim. When Chazal described Torah as the Torah of life, what does that mean? What does the phrase even mean? Chazal are telling us the Torah is called Torah Chaim. So Chaim means life. Very good. What does the word Torah mean? What does the word Torah? What's the actual literal meaning of the word Torah in English? Anybody know? Instructions. Instructions. Right. Torah, like the word mora, mora, horaot, are instructions. Torah literally is translated into English as instructions, guidelines. So when Chazal describe Torah as Torah Chaim, what they're saying is the Torah is instructions for life. Torah is instructions for life. This guy who's not from, who's sitting beside you on the plane, looks at you and thinks, you're just some religious dude who's following a bunch of commandments. And this book that you read is just full of all kinds of rules of how you're supposed to live life. And the real point you want to be able to somehow get across to them is, no, these are instructions on how to live. You want to live life in the best way possible? This book gives you the guidelines of how to get the most out of life. It's not about obeying God. It's not about getting to Olam Haba. It's not about being a good religious Jew because God's going to strike you down if you don't. It's about how to get the most out of life. You want to have a good marriage. You want to raise good kids. You want to have real self-esteem. You want to know the purpose of life. You want to build a, a healthy society. You want to have an emotionally healthy family. You want to feel good about yourself. You want to know what true happiness is, spirituality. All the answers to the dilemmas of life are found in Torah. It's there to make your life deeply, spiritually, emotionally fulfilling and good. That's what the point of Torah is. And it's a huge misconception because a non firm Jew looks at you and thinks it's all just about following a bunch of mitzvahs and getting to the world to come. So while it's true that there's Olam Haba for every mitzvah, we know that, there's also Olam Hazeh for every mitzvah. And that's a chiddush for somebody who's not from. You have to somehow be able to convey to the guy the Torah is instructions to make life better. I'll give you an example of Torah's Chaim. I had uh, years ago, I was teaching a class on a Friday morning here in the yeshiva. We have a program called Essentials right across the hall here. And it's, a pro, it's, like for, it's, it's a drop-in program. You don't have to register or pay. Anybody can drop in any time and just take all kinds of classes and all kinds of topics. Anyway, I'm giving a class on a Friday morning, whatever it was. And uh, there's a guy in the class I had never seen before. Didn't know who he was. So the class was over. I came up to him. I say, what's your name? He tells me his name. I say, how you doing? He says, good. I say, um, you know, how long have you been here in the yeshiva? He says, what's a yeshiva? <laughs> I say, well... You're in one right now. <laughs> it's called Eishat Torah. It's a yeshiva. It's a place where people come to learn about Judaism. How long have you been here? He says, well, I just walked in the door. I have a friend who told me to come. I, I've never been to one of these things before. I just dropped in for the first time. I say, okay, what are your plans for Shabbos? He says, what's Shabbos? <laughs> I say, you know, Shabbat. Like, you know, Friday night, Saturday. He's like, what are you talking about? I say, you know the whole Shabbat thing, Kiddush and family meals? And he's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So I say, you know what? Why don't you come to my house for Shabbos? If you've never done it before, come to my house. Here's my address. Show up about an hour before Shabbos. You'll have, you know, sleep over. You'll spend Shabbos with me. I live in uh, Neve Yaakov. Come for Shabbos. You'll have a really nice time. You'll enjoy it. Fine. Give him an address. I go home. I'm getting ready for Shabbos. I get a knock on the door about an hour before Shabbos. Now, I've got six kids. Everyone's running around the house going crazy, getting the house ready. Knock on the door. I open the door. The guy comes in the house. And at that moment, my four-year-old son was in the bathtub and he was really curious who was at the door. So he jumps out of the bathtub and he's running around the house with shampoo in his hair naked. His sister, who was watching him in the bath, is running after him, yelling at him. like, I don't get back in the bathtub! My wife is yelling at her for yelling at him. My other kids are like doodling on the walls or something. It's like total balagan in the house. He walks in and he says, this is Shabbos? <laughs> Say, no, 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 this is just a warm-up. <laughs> it, gets, it gets better, but calmer. <laughs> so fine. Things settle down a little bit. He's sitting on the couch. He's reading the kids some stories. Oh, when the kids come out of the bath, he sits on the couch, reads them some stories, some Dr. Seuss books, whatever. He's, a, he's relaxed. Things are okay. I jump in the shower. I'm getting ready. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, do I bring this guy with me to shul for Kabbalah Shabbos or not? He has never met an Orthodox Jew in his life. He's never been in a firm neighborhood in his life. He's going to walk into a shul and see a hundred guys in black hats all davening. I mean, I remember the first time I did that. I almost flipped out. <laughs> There's no way he's keeping his little... He'll, he'll go nuts if he sees it. It'll totally scare him off. So I said, you know what? Why don't you stay here, hang out with my kids, read them some stories. 
I'll be back in about an hour. I'm just going to go and pray. He says, okay, no problem. So I go. I'm praying that he'll still be here <laughs> an hour from now when I come back. I'm sure. Fine. I come back. He's cool. Everything's good. He's relaxed. Everything looks fine. So now he doesn't know anything, right? So I have to explain, okay, we're going to sing Shalom Aleichem because we're welcoming in the Shabbos Queen. And we sing Eishas Chayol. It here is with the transliteration. It's about, what's it called? Like, you know, honoring the Jewish woman for preparing the Shabbos and being the center of the home. And, and we wash our hands and we make Kiddush and why we cover the bread. And I'm going through explaining everything. We have a couple of other guests there, whatever. So we're having a pretty normal Shabbos meal. I'm explaining everything as we're doing it. And I'm doing my kids' Parsha sheet with them and we're singing Zmiros and Divrei Torah and whatever. And the whole time, he's just completely quiet. He's just standing, he's just sitting there, like, taking it all in. And about halfway through the meal, he puts up his hand. He says, Rabbi, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He says, what holiday did you say it was today? I said, it's Shabbos. It's like, you know, it's Friday night. We do this every Friday night. He says, you guys do this every Friday night? Like, everyone takes showers and puts away their phones, and everyone's getting ready, and you get all dressed up, and, and you sing songs, and you have guests coming over, and you talk about, about Torah. I say, yeah, I mean, the whole neighborhood. <laughs> there's a million Jews in Israel. There's millions of Jews around the world that are doing this right now. Your grandparents probably used to do this. Your great-grandparents. This is called Shabbos. He says, wow. I had no idea this is my own heritage. This is Shabbos? This is what my grandparents used to do? I had no idea. He says, listen, I grew up in a little town in Florida. There's no Jews in my town. But you know what? If somebody would have told me that there's a family in my little town that once a week they all, the whole family all gets dressed up and they sit around the table and they sing songs together, I think they're a bunch of weirdos. <laughs> like, who does that? Where do you ever see a family in America that says, you know what, kids? Let's get together and have a nice meal and sing some songs. Nobody does that. He says, but it just looks so beautiful. It's so nice. It's such a beautiful thing to see. Halfway through the meal, he says, like, at a certain point in the meal, he says, like, where's your TV? Like, we're in the living room. Like, where's your TV? I say, we don't have one. He says, oh, like, you're not allowed to watch TV? I said, we don't have time for TV. Are you kidding? We're living good lives. Like, we got busy. We're busy with stuff. We're not just spending our time watching TV. He was, just, he was blown away by the whole experience. By the time Shabbos was over, we made Abdullah. He says, that's it. I like this. I got to check it out. I had no idea this is what Judaism was. I want to stick around and learn some more. So he changed his travel plan. He stuck around age for three weeks. And he's coming to classes, and he's learning. He's making friends with the guys and going for Shabbos and whatever. He's having a good time. At the point of about three weeks, he comes to me one day, he sits down with me, he says, you know, Rabbi, there's something I'm really concerned about. There's something I'm beginning to understand here. He says, until now, I kind of thought that the whole Jewish thing was like, this is just stuff that you do because it's nice to do. Like you like praying, so you pray. And you like keeping Shabbos, you keep Shabbos. And you like helping people, so you help people. And you like learning these books, so you learn these books. But I'm kind of getting the feeling, just from talking to all the guys here, that you guys actually believe like, you're commanded to. Like, you have to pray even if you don't feel like it. You have to keep Shabbat even if you don't want to. You have to keep kosher because God said so. I said, yeah, it's called a mitzvah. That's what a mitzvah means. You should know. For most secular Jews, when they hear the word mitzvah, they think the word mitzvah means a good deed. A mitzvah is a good deed. You know what a mitzvah means? It's called a commandment. We actually believe that God, the creator of the universe came to the Jewish people and gave us a book of commandments. And yeah, we actually believe that we're obligated to follow these commandments. It's not just a nice alternative lifestyle. It's not just a fun thing to do because we like davening. We're obligated to follow these commandments because God said so. We take this stuff as reality. Now, for him in his mind, that's already a whole new way of looking at it. Like, you know, if Judaism has a bunch of nice, interesting lifestyle, cultural things that you do because it's good for the family, makes you feel good, that's nice. It's a nice philosophy. But once you talk about it as a commandment, and we take the idea that there really is a God seriously, and he really gave us mitzvahs and Torah, and that's serious, and there's an olam haba, and we take that seriously, now there's a whole weight to it that he never appreciated before. Because now he's encountering a whole new level of what Judaism is. And this is where we go through the... We, we, we transition from Torah's Chaim. And it's helping us there to make your life nicer and better to the phase called Torah's Emes. And Torah's Emes means we believe this stuff is real. I wake up in the morning and I daven even if I don't feel like it because Hashem expects me to. 
I keep kosher even if the tray food, tray food looks good because Hashem expects me to. There's a reality to it. Now, once you talk about reality and religion, that's a very awkward idea for people. Most people who are secular are pretty liberal thinking, and most liberal people thinking look at life and say, you know what? If this is something you like to do, so for you, it's your reality. You believe in something else, so that's your reality. I've got my reality, and you have your reality, and the Buddhist has his reality, and the atheist has his reality, and the vegetarian has his reality. Everyone kind of lives in their own reality. And when we say no, there's a thing called reality with a capital R. Like, we actually believe in God. And when we say we believe in God, what we mean is we believe that God actually exists. I know this is pushing to you, but you should know for American college students it's not. We believe that God actually exists. And by saying that, what we mean is if you're an atheist, you're wrong. You're out, of, you're out to lunch. You're making a mistake. You don't recognize the reality that there's a God who has expectations of you. Now, once you put it in that framework, that's a really harsh idea. People have a really hard idea, a hard time with this idea that there's this judgment of like there's a right and there's a wrong. Either the atheists are right or the believers are right. Among the believers, either the Jews are right or the Christians are right or the Buddhists are right or the Hindus are right or the Jainists or the Taoists or the Zoroastrians or the Muslims, right? <laughs> they can't all be right. Someone's right. And if someone's right, it means everyone else is wrong. That's a hard idea for people. I had once, I remember very clearly, I was talking once to a guy at Jewish, but he grew up as a Buddhist. He grew up in some Buddhist colony somewhere in the States, I don't remember where now. Anyway, he grew up as a Buddhist. He got the very Buddhist kind of mentality of life. We're sitting and talking one day. He says, Rabbi, why do you believe in God? Like, how do you know? So I said, I'll give you my evidence. You know, one, two, three, here's a few, here's my proofs, here's the logic, blah, blah, blah. I went through it, I argued it with him. So after about half an hour, I gave him all of my proofs, and he says to me, okay, I get it. Now I see why it makes sense for you to believe in God. I said, I'm not trying to convince myself. <laughs> I'm trying to convince you that there's a God, and here's my evidence. He said, well, I understand what you're saying, but I just don't see it that way. I said, what do you mean you don't see it that way? Like, you heard what I said. You asked some questions. We clarified it. Like, what, what do you disagree with? He said, well, I just don't believe in God. I said, okay, but... Why not? I gave you my reasons why I do. You said it makes sense to you. You see the logic of it. You're not arguing with me, so why don't you believe in it? He says, well, listen, everyone kind of lives in their own reality. Your reality is you have a logical way of proving to you that you believe in God, and for you, God really exists. I just don't look at life that way. I just don't believe in God. So for me, God just doesn't exist. I said, what does that mean? (laughs) Either God exists and you're wrong, or God doesn't exist and I'm wrong. One of us is making a mistake here. Which one is it? He says, no, it's all a question of perspective, and there's no ultimate reality, and it's all how you look at it. There's no way to really know, and it's it's kind of subjective. I said, listen, let me ask you a question. If we're sitting in a room that has no windows, and before we walked in the room, it was cloudy outside, and there's a possibility of rain, right? So we could argue right now, and I could say, I think it's raining. And you might say, I don't think it's raining. Either it is or it isn't. Either it's raining and I'm right, or it's not raining and you're right. We can't both be right. He says, no, that's not true. If for you, right now, you think it's raining, so for you, right now, it, like, it really is raining. But for me, if it's not raining, it means for me, right now, it's really not raining. And I'm like, gosh, what do I say to the guy now? <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of weird. I said, ah, let me ask you a question. What if we both walk outside together? Either we're going to get wet, which means I'm right, or we're not going to get wet, which means you're right. He says, listen, if you really understand the nature of Buddhist reality, it means if you believe it's raining outside, when you go outside, you're going to get wet. And since I don't believe it's raining outside, it means I'm not. I said, you're retarded. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you actually believe this? You're telling me you ha- your leg hurts. You go to the doctor. doctor says your leg is broken. Well, maybe for you, I don't feel this broken. Life doesn't work that way. There's a thing called reality. Either there is a God who created the world, or there isn't. Either the atheists are right, and the religious people are crazy, or the religious people are right, and the atheists are crazy. Someone's got to make a choice here, and someone's got to figure out what the reality is. It's true about everything in reality, right? There is a God, there isn't a God. He gave a Torah, he didn't give a Torah. We should listen to the rabbis, we shouldn't listen to the rabbis. We believe in the Messiah, we don't believe in the Messiah. There is an Olam Abba, there isn't an Olam Abba. Every one of these questions is consequential. And because it's consequential, it means you have to really know the reality of what's actually true. And it's a hard idea for people to swallow. Just Again, I'm not getting into what the proofs are. I'm just saying to a liberal-minded, secular person that you're going to run into, 
this idea that there is a reality and therefore some people are right and some people are wrong is a kind of not PC way of talking. It sounds kind of judgmental. It sounds kind of looking down on people. It's a hard idea for people to understand. Somebody once gave me, they said, they said, because I, I, I myself was an atheist for many, many years when I was in university, I was doing my degree. I did my degree in philosophy and artificial intelligence. So for the first three years of my degree, I was a totally committed atheist. Three years in, I started examining and reading and speaking to people and arguing and whatever. I went through all process. I came to understand why God, why God makes sense. But in any case, a few years ago, somebody says, you should be in touch with this. There's an organization in America called the American Atheist Association. The AAA, the American Atheist Association. Write to them and you know listen through all their arguments of why they don't believe in God. You know maybe the, maybe you missed something. Maybe there's something they have to say that you haven't heard before. So I wrote them a letter, dear whatever. You know I, I I used to be an atheist. Now I believe in God. I've got compelling reasons to believe in God. Give me your evidence of why you don't believe in God. So I get a letter back from the president of the American Atheist Association, and she says, "Thank you for your inquiry." Here are, th- here are our 30 reasons of why we don't believe in God. I'm like, yikes, 30 reasons. Like, what if one of them is right? <laughs> so reason number one we don't believe in God is religion causes all of the oppression and strife and intolerance and divisiveness and, and oppression in the world. Now, does that mean God doesn't exist? If religion causes strife and oppression and, and uh, divisiveness, does that mean there's no God? No, it means religious people are idiots. It doesn't mean there's no God. Religious people take advantage of God, use God to kill people. Okay, that's not a reason. Reason number two, um, we don't believe somebody has to die on the cross for your sins. I'm like, yeah, I'm in for that. I don't think so either. Okay, we're good. Uh, reason number three, uh, we don't believe church and state should be, uh, should be mixed together. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm also good for that. Okay, we're not into politics. None of these had anything to do with whether God exists. They were just like these political statements of why I don't like God. So I wrote back to her and I said, you know, I read through all 30 of your reasons. You're not giving me any actual compelling reason not to believe in God. You're telling me why you don't like religion, why religious people are intolerant, it's divisive, oppressive, whatever. I agree with you. But give me an actual argument against God's existence. She writes back to me and she says, Dear sir, I can tell by the tone of your letter that you're one of those religious intolerant people. (laughs) She says, I don't understand why people like you make it your business to try and convince people like me to believe in God. You believe whatever you believe. Leave me alone. I'll believe whatever you believe, and I'll leave you alone. So I wrote back, and I said, Dear Mrs., uh, I think her name was Mrs. Franklin. I'm pretty sure she was Jewish. I said, um, I said, I think you're making a big mistake. Because if you're right and God doesn't exist, people like me are completely wasting our lives praying and following commandments and waiting for the world to come and talking to God and we're just like talk- we're crazy people talking to walls thinking there's a God I hope you would stop me from believing in this crazy God that doesn't exist and if I'm right and you don't believe in God and there is a God I'm trying to save you because if you find out when it's too late you're going to miss out on the whole purpose of life she didn't write back to me <laughs> the end of the conversation but the point is, this concept of reality and challenging reality, knowing reality is investigating reality, is something that every one of us should actually do. The Rambam begins, Hilkos Yisori Torah, at the very beginning of the Mishnah Torah, the first halach in Hilkos Yisori Torah, he says, Yesoda Yesodos, the foundation of all foundations, the Amud HaChochmos, the, the pillar of all Chochmos, all wisdom in the world, who Leida, Yidia, Leida, he says, the foundation of all foundations is to know that there is a being, a first being, that created everything. It's the first halacha in all of Tariq mitzvahs, called the mitzvah of Amunah. The mitzvah is not called Amunah, the mitzvah is actually called Yediyah. You have to know that God exists. You have to know that there's a creator. It's a mitzvah to know that God exists. And it's interesting, the Ramah uses the word leida, the word is the word yidiyah. He's not saying, it's not a question of emuna, right? There's a thing called, there's a thing called yidiyah. There's a thing called emuna. They're not exactly the same thing. What's the difference between yidiyah and emuna? Give, give, how do you say the word yidiyah in, in English? No. Knowledge. knowledge, right? Yidiyah is knowledge. There's things that we know. What's an example of something that you know? Give me a non-religious example of anything that you know. The sky is blue. The sky is blue. Actually, right now it's not. But okay. <laughs> Usually in the daytime, the sky is blue, right? You know the sky is blue. 
There's things that we don't know, but we believe. That's called emuna. What's an example of something you believe in? God. Give me a non-religious example. I believe that. You believe what? Trump is good. You believe Trump is good. Okay. There you go. Don't want to get too political here, but okay. I'll go. I'll go. Right? You can't say you know Trump is good because <laughs> with Trump anything is possible, right? But you believe he's good. You believe the Russians didn't corrupt the elections. You believe he actually knows what he's talking about. You believe he's got an actual plan, even though it doesn't seem like it sometimes. There's things we know. There's things we believe. There's a thing called Yudhiya. There's a thing called the Muna. There's a third category that we call faith. We don't know it. We don't even believe it, but we have faith in it. We have faith in. We have faith in that. The dictionary definition of faith, Webster's de- uh, definition of faith is faith is when you accept something as true with zero evidence. Knowledge is I've got a lot of evidence. I can prove it. Belief is I've got some evidence, right? I have some reason to believe Trump is good. The economy is doing better. Unemployment is down, blah, 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 blah. I've got some evidence why I believe in Trump. I have a lot of knowledge of why this guy is blue. Faith is I have zero evidence for something, but I accept it as true anyway. What's an example of faith? Something that you have faith in. Again, give me a non-religious example of something. I have faith that... Any idea? Science is facts. The what? Science is true. Is that faith that? Science is true. Yeah, fa- I've got lots of evidence that science is true. Gravity, I just proved it to you. There's lots of evidence that science is true. That people are good. I have faith that people are good, right? I saw a bum on the street, and he wanted to borrow money, and he promised he'd pay me back. I have faith that one day he'll pay me back. I have faith that um, I have faith that it will be peace in Israel sometime soon, right? I don't know it. I don't believe it. <laughs> but I really hope it's true, and I have faith in it. Faith means when you accept something as true with zero evidence to back it up. Knowledge is called Yediyah. Belief is called Amunah. Faith in Hebrew, the word of faith doesn't exist in the Hebrew language. There is no word for faith in Hebrew because it's simply not a Jewish idea to blindly accept something just because somebody said so. Right? It's called blind faith. It's called taking a leap of faith. The idea that you should just blindly follow something because there's a book that says so, or there's a guru that says so, or there's a rabbi that says so, or your mom said so, or your society says so, well, you just have to follow it just because there's no good reason, is not a Jewish idea. That's why the Rambam says, it's a mitzvah to know that there's a God. The Ramchal says the mitzvah is lahamin v'lahed. He talks about both of them. Nobody talks about the idea of having faith in Judaism. Nobody's ever going to tell you, in the context of Judaism, why should you believe in God? Just because. There's no just because. There's reasons why. There's a rationale to it. Why should we believe God spoke to and Harsina and give us a thought? There's reasons behind it. Why should we assume that Chazal have a Messorah? They may, maybe they just made up the whole Torah Shabbat Peh. How do we know Torah Shabbat Peh? There's reasons why we establish Torah Shabbat Peh as being authentic. It's not just follow the rabbis because they're the rabbis and they say so. So in every key aspect of Judaism, there's enough evidence to say, I have a basis to say why I know it's true. Yeah? Isn't there a concept of a But in the is, I know why they're chachamim, and I know why I should trust them, right? Huh? So it just means that the moon is so partial to me, I don't even need the proofs anymore. It's so obvious to me, Kodesh Baruch Hu runs the world. I don't need to look for a piece of that, right? I don't need evidence that my mom is my mom. I know she's my mom. I don't need, I don't need a DNA test to know she's my mom, right? I have a moon in a doctor because he's already proven. He's got a degree on the wall. He's been my doctor for years and years. I have good reasons to trust them. A moon is kacham, a moon is are both the idea of a trust or a belief based on something that's already there that's solved. A moon is is it some, I have a moon because it's pashut that I should believe because it's so, when you look at the world with, on, with objective eyes, it's pashut that Hashem runs the world. How it's partial, we're going to get to. We're going to see in, the, in one of the other classes. So the point is this. You should realize with anybody you talk to who's not from, the, um, the misconception that they have coming into it is that Judaism is a leap of faith. That's their misconception. Because the truth is, if you were to ask a Christian why they believe in the whole Jesus story, they're going to say faith. And if you ask a Buddhist why they believe in the whole Buddhist story, they're going to say, well, because Buddha said so. Well, why do you believe in Buddha? Well, because Buddha said so. You ask a Muslim why I believe in Muhammad. They say, well, I'll chop off your head if you don't believe in Muhammad. You, have to, you can't even question Muhammad as a prophet. Of course he's a prophet. I had once, I was once in a cab with a Muslim cab driver. He's taking me home from the old city at night. And he's listening to some, I don't know, some Arab music on his, he's got a CD playing with some Arab music. And I'm sitting in the back minding my own business. And 
He says, you know, he starts talking to me. He says, do you know what music I'm listening to? I said, no. He says, I'm listening to an imam chanting passages from the Quran. I said, okay. He said, well, right now he's on the chapter that talks about Joseph and the brothers and when Joseph was sold into slavery. And I'm like, okay. I, I, I studied Quran actually a little bit when I was in university. I said, very nice, okay. He stops for a minute. He says, you know, there's really only one big difference between Jews and Jews and Muslims because we have the same stories in the background of Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael and, and Isaac and Jacob. We have the same prophets, the same history. There's only one difference between us. I said, yeah, what's the difference? He says, the difference is we have the true Torah, the true, Jew, the true religion, because Muhammad was a true prophet, and your prophets were corrupt, and the rabbis were corrupt, and they changed the Torah around, and that's why Judaism isn't true, and Islam is true. Now, he doesn't know he's talking to a guy who's been doing th- discovery seminars for the last 25 years. <laughs> so he said, let me ask you one question. Why do you believe the Quran is actually the word of God? He says, because Muhammad was the final true prophet of God. Allah appointed Muhammad as a prophet. I say, how do you know that's true? So he says, because it says right in the Quran. In the Quran, it says that Muhammad is the final true prophet of God. I said, yeah, but Muhammad wrote it. He says, of course he wrote it. He couldn't have lied. I say, why couldn't he have lied? Because he's a true prophet. Prophets don't lie. I say... You know, that's called circular reasoning. <laughs> like, you think he's a prophet because the book says he's a prophet. The reason he can't lie is because he said that he's a prophet and prophets don't lie. I could write down right now, hi, my name is Moshe Zeldman. I'm a prophet. Give me all your money. And I can't lie because it says that I'm a prophet. He gets very quiet. And I'm like, I shouldn't have, <laughs> I shouldn't have gotten into this. <laughs> Late at night, I'm away back to Ramallah. It's not a good time to get into this argument. So he gets very quiet. He says, you know, you Jews think you're so clever. I say, I don't think it's a question of being clever. Just, you know, do you have any objective, actual reason to believe that Muhammad was a prophet? He says, of course not. The whole beauty of Islam is that it's faith. We are willing to blindly follow the word of Muhammad. I said, okay, I'm not. (laughs) End of conversation. That's all all there is to it. Every religion in the world, there are thousands of religions in the world, every single one of them is premised on the idea of taking the leap of faith. And many of them are proud of it. Right? I'm willing to believe it even if there's no reason to. That's how religious I am. That's how believing I am. That's how how committed I am. And in Judaism we say the word of faith doesn't even exist in the language in our dictionary. There's no such thing as faith. We have reasons to believe. That's what Taurus MS means. Now, here's the difficulty you're going to have. The, I'll put it like this. The whole side of Torah Chaim, and you're gonna, in, the, in the seminar you're going to have in the following weeks, the side of Torah that's called Torah Chaim is where we try and explain to a person what the value of Judaism is, and what the beauty of Shabbos is, and what the power of prayer is, and what Ben al Machavero mitzvahs are all about, and how Torah, about Mido, Torah talks about Midos and self-growth, and the Jewish family. And, right, we can show somebody all the beauty of Judaism. That's the Torah Chaim side. The Torah's Emma side is, let's show you the proofs. Let's show you the evidence. God, Torah, Misenai, Munus Chachamim, Mesora. We'll show you the evidence of how we know it's really true. Now, you should realize, as long as you're talking about the nice stuff, and it's uplifting, and it has a nice value, and right, Shemir Salashim makes your life better, and Avodos Hamidos makes you a happier person, and you'll have a better family life, and blah, 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 blah. People love hearing that stuff, because why not? <laughs> It'll make my life better. I'm into it. Once you start encroaching on the side of Torah's Emma's, it's true, it's real, you got to do it even if you don't feel like it. That's where the resistance begins. All the resistance begins when you go from the phase of Torah Chaim to the phase of Torah Semes, mainly because people have ideas. People don't want to hear it. People don't like changing. If it's a change that's positive and I'll only do it if I feel like it, I'm in. Once you're telling me I have an obligation, I have to have mincha even if I don't feel like it and put on tefillin and be shomer negia and shomer shabbos and shomer kosher and shomer shom. I don't feel like it. I'm happy the way I am. Leave me alone. So the whole idea of proofs, as much as we've got great armaments and great tools and great proofs and great technologies of how to prove Torah, we're gonna, you'll, hear, you'll hear a lot of it in the, in the following weeks. You have to realize you're talking to somebody who basically isn't interested in hearing that. He's looking at you and thinking, okay, you got this funny thing on your head, you got these funny strings hanging out of your pants, you don't touch girls, you're going to prove to me that I should be like you? I don't want to be like you. I'd much rather be like me. I can party and do whatever I want. You're, t- you're trying to convince me that I should keep your religious values? It's like convincing me to go to jail. 
I don't want to put down my phone for 25 hours once a week. I don't want to eat kosher pizza when I can have my pepperoni pizza. I don't want to not touch a girl until I'm married. That sounds ridiculous. So even if you technically can prove it to them, they're not interested in it being proven and they don't want to hear it. So you have to realize the whole psychology in Kirub is the dynamic of how do I get somebody to hear something that they don't really want to hear? How do you get them over that hump? That's really the challenge. I'll tell you a great story I had uh, years ago. There was a guy in Yeshiva, one of my students, Paul Chuva, and uh, he tells me one day, he says, you know, I have a good friend who's in the country right now visiting, and uh, Jewish but totally not religious. He's actually an atheist. I lo- he says, Rabbi, I'd love you to get to meet this guy and like talk to him and challenge him and show him all your proofs and all your evidence and convince him. I said, sure, tell him to come to Yeshiva. I'll meet him for an hour, no problem. So the next day he comes to me, he says, no, I spoke to my friend last night, I'm not interested. He doesn't want to meet you, he doesn't want to come to A, she doesn't want to get brainwashed, He's not, he doesn't want to talk to you. I said, okay, so, you know, he can call me, I can meet him in town for a cup of coffee. He's like, no, he doesn't want to talk to you, he doesn't want to meet you. Okay, fine. About two weeks goes by, and one day I'm sitting in the base medrash learning with somebody. Some random guy comes, taps me on the shoulder. He says, uh, are you Rabbi Zeldman? I said, yeah. He says, my name is Scott. I'm Josh's friend, I'm here to visit you. I said, Scott, oh, I heard about you. You're the friend, you're the guy, I, th- I, th- I thought you didn't want to come to, to H to be with me. He said, yeah, well, they changed my mind. I'll explain it later. We know, when can we meet? We made a time to meet, later, a couple later hours later. So I sit down with him. I say, Scott, what changed your mind? Why, do, why did you decide to meet me? He says, I'll tell you the truth, Rabbi. My friend Josh bet me $20 that I'd be too chicken to come and spend an hour talking to you. So here I am. <laughs> like, okay, this will be interesting. <laughs> so what do you want to talk about? He says, I want to talk about God. I'm an atheist. I understand that you were an atheist once upon a time and you changed your mind. I want to hear your evidence. Why, why, don't, why do you believe in God now? I said, I'm happy to share it with you, but let me ask you something. I said, have you ever spent any time on it? Are we starting from the beginning? Like, have you, had any, have you read any books? Have you studied this stuff at all? He says, yeah. I just, this past summer, I finished doing my degree at Cambridge in philosophy. I spent three years of my philosophy program studying theology. I've heard all the arguments on the question of God's existence. The modern philosophers, the postmodern philosophers, the existentialist philosophers, the religious philosophers, the scientific philosophers, the Greek philosophers. I've heard all the different opinions about God's existence, all the pro, all the anti, and I'm convinced there's no God. I want to hear what you have to say. I thought, oh man, I'm in trouble. <laughs> this guy's like a professional atheist. <laughs> like, what, like, what am I going to tell him he hasn't already heard before, right? So I said, let me ask you a question, Scott. In all the time for those years you were studying and researching and debating, and did you ever stop and ask yourself the question of how you feel about the idea of God? He says, how do I feel about it? What kind of a question is that? What do you mean, how do I feel? Who cares how you feel? I said, how do you feel about it? He says, it doesn't matter how you feel. You hear the arguments, you look at the evidence, you weigh it out, you debate it, you come to a conclusion. I don't believe in God. Give me your evidence. I say, I think you're making a mistake. I think how you feel about it has a big role to play. How you feel about anything has a big weight in the decision you make about what you end up believing in. Because I don't know what you're talking about. We had an argument about it, about negias and biases. And I say, Scott, let me give you an example. Okay? I say, I just ha- a few months ago, I said, I just finished reading the biography of Albert Einstein. Okay? It was in my bathroom reading for a couple of months. I finished reading the biography of Albert Einstein. There's an amazing story in the book where Einstein describes the following. He says, in the 1910s, in in, uh, the world scientific community in the 1910s, there was a major debate among scientists about this universe, the whole universe, whether it's an expanding universe or a contracting universe or a static universe. Expanding, contracting, static, it was a whole debate. Most scientists believed it was static. Most scientists believed it wasn't getting bigger or smaller. It's been the same size the whole time. Comes along in the 1920s, a guy named Edwin Hubble comes along, invents this huge, massive telescope that can actually see into other galaxies. He sees all the galaxies in the universe are moving away from each other. He, re- he, re- he measures the rate of acceleration of all the galaxies, makes a bunch of calculations, comes to the conclusion that the universe is expanding. He goes to a conference of physicists. Hubble goes to Europe. Europe goes to a conference of physicists, presents his findings, gives a presentation of it. They gave him a standing ovation. Like, wow, we were wrong, you proved it, you showed the evidence, the universe is expanding, like, that changes everything, that's amazing. Gave him a standing ovation. Einstein wasn't there at the conference, he was somewhere else in Europe. Anyway, so a friend of his sent him the paper, and said, Einstein, you've got to look at this, We've, they proved that the universe is expanding, we were all wrong. 
So Einstein reads the paper, and here's what he says. I read the paper. I wrote back to my friend, and I said, I find this idea of the universe expanding irritating. He's irritated that the universe is expanding. Now, I told Scott, I said, when you hear a scientist say he's irritated by the results of an experiment or the results of, of our findings, is that a sign of being, is that like an intellectual reaction or is that an emotional reaction? Emotional. Clearly emotional, right? Remember the first time you ever heard the universe is expanding? Did it irritate you? <laughs> like, oh man, it's expanding! Terrible! Who cares, right? Whatever, it's a bunch of scientific stuff. He's irritated that the universe is expanding. So he writes back to his friend and he says, I don't accept it, I think he made a mistake, I don't know, I don't believe it. Hubble finds out that Einstein doesn't believe in the results. So Hubble invites Einstein to California to look through the telescope and see for himself. Einstein flies to California, looks through the telescope, makes the measurements, makes the calculations. The universe is expanding. So what does Einstein say? I think there's something wrong with the telescope. They take apart this entire massive telescope. It takes three weeks. They take apart the entire telescope. They polish all the lenses and recalibrate it, put the whole thing back together again, put it all out, make the measurements again, make the calculations again. The universe is still expanding. Einstein says, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I think there's a mistake here somewhere. He spends months and months on paper reworking the math and reworking the measurements and recalculating it, finding other ways of calculating, using other factors and other equations, blah, 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 blah. He spends months and months on it until he finally finds a way of convincing himself that the universe isn't expanding. The only problem is, he was wrong. <laughs> and over the next few years, every other major scientist saw clearly that there was evidence that the universe is expanding. Einstein just refused to believe it. For 15 years, Einstein didn't believe it. Until his last year of life. And on his deathbed, Einstein writes, he says, the evidence that I see now the universe is expanding is overwhelming. I see that I was wrong. And Einstein, in his final writings, he says, the fact that I didn't accept the evidence 15 years ago was the biggest mistake of my scientific career. The last 15 years of his life, he didn't discover anything because he was totally out to lunch on a basic fact of the universe. Why? Because he just didn't want it to be true. So I told Scott, I say, you know, Einstein's not an idiot. He's, we, we all know Einstein's a smart guy. But you know what? Sometimes a really, really smart guy can find a way of convincing themselves of anything they want. Don't you hate learning with a smart Harusa who always thinks they're right? And even when they're wrong, they're really good at making it look they're right, they're right, and it just drives you crazy. <laughs> like, no matter how, if you're really clever, you convince yourself of anything you want. No matter how good, it's always going to be that. So I told Scott, I said, you know, the issue is, like, you're spending all these years in university looking at God's existence. If you don't know how you feel about it, you don't know emotionally how you're going to relate to it, you might just be convincing yourself of anything you want to believe. We had a whole argument about it. Scott looks at his watch. He says, Rabbi, it's 5 o'clock. i got to go. Thanks for the time. Got up, and he leaves the building. And I thought, oh, I had died for a whole hour. I, didn't, I, I never got around to giving him any of my evidence. I, I have a whole bunch of proofs. I, I never got, we had a whole talk about biases and Einstein and psychology, and I never got around to giving him any of my proofs. Anyway, the guy left. That, that was it, whatever. I lost him. I come to the yeshiva the next day. I walk in the building, 10 o'clock in the morning. There's Scott sitting, waiting for me. I go over to him and say, Scott, what are you doing back in Yeshiva? Another $20 bet? <laughs> what are you doing here? He says, Rabbi, I'll tell you what happened last night. I left the Yeshiva, and you left me with this question, how do I feel about God? I went back to the hotel where I was staying. I thought about it. And I realized, you know what? I really don't like the idea <laughs> <laughs> that there's some being up in the sky who's looking down at me, keeping score, reading my mind, knowing my thoughts, holding me accountable, like he's watching me every moment. He's, he expe has expectations of me. He's keeping score on everything. I really don't like the idea of God. It's like, it's irritating. It's very uncomfortable to think that there's a God. And he says, the more I realized how much I don't like the idea, I just went back to think about all the stuff I did in those three years in university. You know what I was doing for those three years? For every time a professor got up to try and prove why there was a God, I spent whatever energy I had trying to find a way to poke holes in his argument. I'd look up stuff online, find, find people to counter him, and, and look up other research. And whenever a guy got up to prove why there wasn't a God, I'm taking notes, and I'm confirming what he's saying, and I'm writing it down, I'm sending it out to my friends, and I'm convincing myself. He realized, he says, I realized I spent my entire three years at Cambridge convincing myself to believe there's no God. He says, Rabbi, I didn't sleep the entire night. 
I spent the whole night just reviewing what did I learn here and what did that say and what was I thinking about that and why was I so opposed to that? What was that, what was that argument again? He says, you know what I realized? Over the whole night of thinking about it, I realized as much as I don't like the idea of God, I'm convinced there's a lot of strong logic and it actually makes perfect sense that God exists. So Scott goes overnight from being an atheist to being a believer. To this day, he's learning Kolel. He's been learning Kolel for the last eight, nine years at least. He's, been, he's a serious guy. His whole life turned around in one night. I didn't prove anything to him. I didn't give him any argument. All I was basically saying to him is, come on, man, just be honest with yourself. How do you know you're not fooling yourself? And he realized, yeah, I think I am fooling myself. We do that to ourselves all the time. So here I am in the Kiru situation, right? I got a guy who's not from, and I want to try and convince him and show him arguments and prove it. You have to realize, he looks at you and thinks you're in jail because you have this religion you've got to keep. And all you're trying to do is convince him to join you in jail. He doesn't want to be in jail. He's got a free life right now, right? There's people that are from, there's people that are fry. You know what fry means? It means free. He's free. He doesn't have rules. He can do whatever he wants. You're going to convince me to believe in God and Torah and i got to follow the 630 commandments? No thanks. So how do you get him over the hump? And the answer really is that if you start with, with, uh, with um, if experience number one, if, a, if stage number one of Kiruv is the stage of Torah Schaim, and they see the beauty of Yiddishkeit, and they see the power of Yiddishkeit, and they see the simcha of Yiddishkeit, they see a Shabbos table, they see what it means to go into a base medrash and learn Torah, and get into a Gemara, and see the Geshmak of real learning, and what it means to be from, and the value, and they see what family life is, see what a from neighborhood is like, and see what from people are like, and they, they're exposed to the beauty of it. Of course, there are, are there religious people that have bad lives? Yes. Are there religious people that are drug addicts? Are there religious people that steal? Of course there are. But compared to the secular world, you can't, it's a joke. You look at a from society, and you say, here's a society of people that are emotionally healthy. Here's a system that really works. Are there Jews that blow it? Are there religious Jews that make mistakes or that are Achil Hashem or that don't follow Torah properly? Of course there are. We know that. But it's tiny percentages compared to what goes on in the secular world. I was telling people, I said, I say, don't judge Judaism by the Jews. Rather be the Jew that Jews judge Judaism by. Don't judge Judaism by the Jews. Are the Jews that make mistakes of the religious and they're idiots? Yes. There's idiots in every culture and every religion and every society. Every nation has idiots. Don't judge Judaism by the Jews, be the Jew that Jews judge Judaism by. And when a person who's not from looks at it, they realize, like, wow, you guys have something that I don't have. You walk into a yeshiva like Aisha Torah, a hundred balei tshuva sitting and learning, like, <laughs> these guys were totally secular a year ago, or two, three, four years ago. Nobody's forcing them there. Their parents aren't forcing them there. Many of the guys learning in age right now are there, and their parents are forcing them out. If you stay one more year in yeshiva, that's it. <laughs> We're going to talk to you again. I'm not supporting you. You're a leech. You're a parasite. I'm not going to take care of you anymore. You didn't finish your degree. You're a bum. I'm writing you out of my will. Too bad, mom. I like learning Torah. Like, it's, it's amazing to see a whole movement of Jews becoming from because they see the value and the beauty of it. And their parents think they're crazy. And their friends think they're crazy. And they do it anyway. So as long as you do stage one in a powerful way and people see the beauty of Yiddishkeit <laughs> to the point where they want it to be true, like, Shabbos is so nice. I just, I love, you want, you want to get a guy to a point of saying, like, I love the idea that I put down my stupid phone on an Arab Shabbos and I don't touch the thing for 25 hours. 25 hours without email, without Facebook, without Twitter is a bracha. It's amazing. I can actually, like, talk to people and have conversation and not worry about everything else in the world. I just enjoy being in the moment. What a bracha. When a person gets to a point in their Yiddishkeit where they see the value of it and they see the beauty of it and they want it to be true, then the second stage of Taurus Emes is very easy. Because you're not fighting against them. You're working with them. They want it to be true. You can explain the issues of science and Torah and evolution and proofs of God, proofs of Torah. You can give them all the evidence. They're not opposed to it anymore. But if you don't do Taurus Chaim as the first step, then Taurus Emes becomes a really hard sell. People are opposed. People get crazy. People have all kinds of ideas. And you have a very hard time getting through to people. Okay, we have five minutes for questions before we take a break. Yes? Um, you can't do, how do you do Torah's time on an airplane? You can't bring it to your neighborhood. Too it's hard, you're right. So what you have to just think through is the mis- even just thinking through the misconceptions theoretically. In other words, I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll give you an example from my own personal life. This might help you. Um, 
so when I became from myself, for me, it was actually the opposite of what I'm teaching. I became from first because of Taurus Emmis. Somebody proved to me, and then I'm like, okay, I'll do it. And then I, and Taurus Emmis became the second stage. In other words, I was on campus. I was having a good time. Party animal, like every other normal secular guy. And I meet this guy who's a Baal Tshuva. I'd never heard of the word Baal Tshuva in my life. This guy's, hi, I'm a Baal Tshuva. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what religion is that? He's like, no, I'm Jewish. I just became religious. I said, why would anybody do that? That's ridiculous. Like, I know religious people become non-religious. Why would a non-religious person ever become religious? Like, are you crazy? So, so well, because there's evidence and I can prove it to you. I'm like, you can't prove anything. I went to Jewish day school. And I asked rabbis questions. There's no evidence. There's no reason to believe. He's like, no, there is. And I can sit down. I can show it to you. So I was so opposed. I so didn't want it to be true. It took a long, long time for me to be convinced that it was true. I'll put it like this. Every time I met a clever <coughs> rabbi who gave me a good argument of why I believe in Judaism, why I believe in God, I'd go back to campus, back to my professors, and say, come on, guys, give me a good answer. <laughs> There's got to be a good, a good way out of that. Because that's, ev- that's a good evidence. What's the other side? History professors, biology professors, physics professors, uh, philosophy professors. And sometimes they had really good a- answers. I go back to the rabbi. Ah, I got a good answer for you. Oh, that's also a good point. I didn't think of that. Hold on a minute. <laughs> back to these guys, right? It was three years back and forth and back and forth until I say, okay, I'm stuck. I've heard all the evidence on both sides. I've really looked at it. Reformed, conservative, orthodox, different religions, atheism. I mamish investigated it. I'm stuck that orthodox Judaism is the only thing that actually makes sense. I guess i got to do it. So, start keeping Shabbos. Show me this, show me that. I'm following Torah. I actually didn't like it at all. I didn't like davening. I didn't like tefillin. I didn't. Li- I didn't. I wasn't so into learning. I didn't. <laughs> I, there's very little I did. I didn't like benching. I didn't like brachos. There's very little that I actually like. So why am I doing? Because I got to do it. My friends are like Moshe. Like you're crazy. Like if it, if it's making you so unhappy, you don't like it. So why are you doing it? And my answer is because it's true. You don't have a choice. You know, a doctor says take medicine. You take medicine. You don't have to be an idiot. You don't, you don't, you don't have to like medicine to take medicine. If you're sick and you need medicine, you take the medicine. I'm, taking, I'm Jewish. I'm stuck with this thing called Judaism. I'll, I'll follow it. And I lived that way for like a year. I was from for a year, miserably from for about a year. I meet a rabbi. I'm at a Shabbos table one time with a bunch of other Bali Tshuva. And they're all, you know, it's, we love Shabbos and we love davening and we love chesed and we love learning. I'm like, you're crazy. I don't love any of this stuff. So the rabbi says to me, he says, listen, Moshe, think about it like this. Why do you think God wants you to do all these things anyway? Like, he's God. He doesn't need you to pray to him. He doesn't need you to remind him how great he is. He's God and you're not, right? He's infant. He's all-powerful. He doesn't need anything. Why would he even need you to do mitzvahs to begin with? I said, I don't know. I have no idea. He says, think about it like this. If God doesn't get anything out of it, he doesn't need you to do a mitzvah. And yet he's commanding you to do it anyway. You know why he's commanding you? Because it's for your own good. Mitzvahs are for your good. They are there to make your life better, not God's life better. He doesn't need you to make a bracha. He doesn't need you to say, He doesn't need the praise. He doesn't need you to keep Shabbos. He doesn't need you to keep coat. He doesn't need you to bench. He doesn't need you to thank him or praise him or ask him. Or He doesn't need it. He's telling you to do it because it's for your own good. And my kids, I tell my kids to say please and thank you. I don't need to hear it. I want them to be grateful people so I make them say it. So when this rabbi tells me, he says, like, the, he says basically the point of every mitzvah, the Ramchal talks about this, there's many sources that say this, the point of every mitzvah is to make your life more deeply fulfilling, to give you a better, deeper sense of what life could really be like, spiritually, emotionally, mitos, in, in, in your relationships. So if you're doing a mitzvah, you're not getting anything out of it, you're kind of like missing the whole point of the mitzvah. You'll get olam haba, you did it anyway, but like... To really get the dvekus and the goodness and the growth of a mitzvah, you got to know what a mitzvah really is and why you're doing it. So I realized that for me, and I, this is something you could certainly share on an airplane, that we all live with the misconception that religion is about serving God and obeying God. It's not. It's about making your life a better life. Just knowing that. Just knowing that changes the reality. And you should know, in other, most other religions, almost every other religion, it is about serving God. Because the gods are many and the gods have egos or the gods are limited or the gods are weak or the god died on your cross and you've got to make them happy now or whatever it is. They all have needs. So religion is about serving the needs of the gods. Judaism, infinite god, all-powerful, has no need, has no limitations. It's for our good, not for his good. So just knowing that as a principle changes it. Yeah? Um, if the aim is to get them to be objective, and that's, if you don't time, does that, I did not skew that like, too far the other way. It's a fair question. You know, you, 
I don't want somebody saying, well, you know, Shabbos is so wonderful and so beautiful. Sure, I'll become religious and daven three times a day and get married and raise a family. Because, like, you got to know it's true also, and you don't want to be so biased. The issue is we grew up in a society today that is so anti the idea of anything spiritual. It's all about physical gratification. Religion looks crazy. When you get a guy to have a good experience with Shabbos or with learning a Gemara or sitting in a base medrash or just, you know, meeting normal, happy, from people, you're not... You're not, um, you're not brainwashing them, and you're not um, manipulating them. You're just showing them the reality of what Yiddishkeit really is. That's the reality of what Yiddishkeit is. You, you, want, you want to be a person yourself who can look at somebody who's not from and say, I'm so happy that I was born into this, this side of the fence and not that side of the fence. If you're able to say to yourself, Baruch Hashem, I'm on the side, of, the side of right and I'm enjoying this life, you're just getting him to realize he's missing out on something. It's not manipulative because you're not convincing of something that isn't true. You're trying to show them that it is true. Right? Shabbos should be a beautiful experience. Davening should be something you get into. Making brachos should make you feel grateful for the things you have in life. So if he gets a taste of that, of that reality, then of course he'll want it to be true for all the right reasons. You're not, like I say, it's not, you're not playing a game of convincing of something that isn't true. That would be manipulative. You're just showing him the reality of what is true and he'll want it to be true. Okay, we'll stop now. I will see you guys again. Thank you. Shabbat <laughs> We're going to take a two-minute break. If I need to use the bathroom, then we're going to start in around two minutes.